Good morning, Madison. Good morning, Johanna. Good morning, Good morning. Johnny. People are always asking me why. Why do the same thing every year? Why not move on? But I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Johnny? Present. I'm comfortable. I know the routine. United States of America. And I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty popular around here. I do really well in sports. No! No, not my house! Well, I'm just very successful here. Why would I go and mess that up by graduating? A B. Boat. I mean, in the first grade, I may not know all the answers. D. D. Dog. E. The hours are longer. I hear they don't even have nap time. I mean, I just don't see the upside. Then first grade leads to second grade, second to third. It's really good. Then you're in high school reading boring books with no pictures. Three, four, five. But he was still, still hungry. Next thing you know, people expect you to get a job and give up summer vacation. <laughs> No, sir. I think I found my niche. Thank you very much. Home sweet kindergarten. Besides, I mean, what if I failed first grade? How humiliating would that be? No, nope, just don't think I could handle that kind of embarrassment. And sometimes better watch you. That was not a good choice. Very disappointed. We are in a series talking about the renewing of our minds. And, and that's kind of a funny video of, 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 for us to think about that. But the reality is that sometimes our minds are filled with things and we're like, I, I got that. I got that. I know this. I got this. And yet God says, I, I want to bring something deeper into your life, something into your mind. I want to change and renew some stuff. Um, and I want you to see a different perspective than you've seen before. And I want you to understand that, that it happens to all of us. It's true of all of us. I, I think about, I go back and I look and I think about, you know, 24 years ago when I started in pastoral ministry. You know, I, I, I got this mindset of things that, you know, I've been told and, you know, I've read and, and, and I'm preaching those with all my heart. I, I want you to understand, I wouldn't preach any of those today. Why? Because God has taken us deeper in the knowledge of who He is and who His kingdom is. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. People say, oh man, I can't believe that. No, no, no. We're growing. And see, we all have to be in this process of where we're growing and He's renewing, bringing us into a different focus of what God wants. And so in this series, we've been looking at Revelation, or Revelation, yeah, Romans 12. Where Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in the presence of God, to present your bodies as living and holy sacrifices acceptable to God, which is the spiritual act of worship. You know, thank God, you say, well, thank God we're not talking about that one right now. And do not be conformed to this world and be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that, watch this, we may prove what the will of God is. How many are like, I just don't want to know the will of God, man, I want to live the will of God. Okay, we got a few of you. Let's try that again. How many of you just don't want to know you want to live? Come on now. See, that's the picture Paul's painting. He said, if you want to walk in the good and perfect will of God, he said, there's some things I've got, got to work on. I've got to help you understand. Last week we were talking about understanding. Some things you need to understand. And here's the cool thing. He wants to teach us the deep things of, of, of the kingdom. He wants to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom to us. He wants to reveal his world to those who love him. So here's the question. Any Jesus lovers in here this morning? Hey, hey, so here's the deal. If you love Jesus, guess what? He wants to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom to you. He wants to reveal the mysteries of his world, the depth of his world, a, a deeper understanding of his world and of his kingdom. He wants to give it to you. To you. Now, now turn to your neighbor and say, we're talking about you. Come on. We're talking about you. Well, you say, now wait a minute, Pastor. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. God doesn't want to give me that. 
God doesn't want me to, he's not going to reveal those things to me. He's not going to trust me with those things. He's not going to do those things in my life. He knows me, and he knows I can't handle those things. Listen to me. Oh, pastor, that's why we need, oh, that's why we need pastors and we need elders, you know, because they, they can understand that stuff. We can't understand that stuff. Right now, I want you to understand, that is a lie of the devil. It is a lie of people who don't want you to know. And in history, there's been people who don't want you to know. You know why? Because if you don't know, that I can be in charge. Come on now. I want you to understand, God says, if you are in Christ Jesus, He wants to reveal the very depth, and you are fully capable of, of doing that because of what he's done in you. So I want to suggest sometimes we like the excuse. Well, I just can't. Uh, there's no way. God doesn't want me to have that. Don't let the devil lie to you again. Don't let him die, lie to you. You know, one of the things I, do, I love around here is I'm watching some of you who are over 80, soaking up stuff, growing in stuff, even though you say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer to the end of the journey, it doesn't matter. Because he wants to renew all of our minds. Well, I, I'm still 10 or 11. We're 11 now, right, Jacqueline? Come on, I had a party lot this weekend, woohoo! And the reality is, see, your pastor sees stuff on Facebook. But the reality is, um, he wants all of us to be renewed. He wants our minds to, to be renewed in those things that he desires. He wants to reveal the mysteries. Look at what it says in Jeremiah 33. I just want to make sure you understand this. Jeremiah 33, verse 2 says this, and this is what the Lord says, He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and created it, he whose name is the Lord, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things that you do not know. Now, here's the next thing. The Lord, the one who created all things, he says, hey, guess what? I got some stuff to reveal to you. How many of you think that if, if God created it all, he knows some stuff about it? Amen? Because isn't that how it works? That he who creates things, he who can tear things down and rebuild them, is what? Knows some stuff. I got a guy I went to high school with. Um, next slide. Um, earlier this summer, he found some old Harley for a little bit of nothing. Um, took it into his garage. And, and so on Facebook, all summer, all we've seen is pictures of him tearing it down and, and rebuilding it. And here's some of the pictures. And, and, and there at the bottom is a picture when it's finished. Man, it's looking good. Man, it's, it's looking beautiful. Now listen, I know absolutely nothing about that. But I guarantee if I go over and ask him, if I go over and say, hey, tell me about that, he could tell me everything about every nut, every bolt, every shaft, every wire, every everything about that, right? That's God. God knows all that. And he says, hey, 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 Janet, I want you to know it too. Come on now. I want you all to know what it is. He says, if you call to me. Now, that word call there is a cry. It's not, well, God, I'd like to know. God would be nice to know. No, Lord, I want to know. See, there's passion in that word. Lord, I want to, I want to know the deeper thing. I want to know these things. If you call to me, I will, not I might, I could, or I'll think about it. No, I will answer you, and I will tell you. I will speak to you. I will reveal to you. I will show you some stuff. Well, what kind of stuff, Pastor? Well, let me tell you. Um, it says great stuff. Some great things. That word means great in magn it's magnitude and number. I'm going to show you some magnificent things. I'm going to tell you some magnificent things. Mighty things. Those things that are out of reach. Unattainable. That's what mighty actually means. That, that Greek word. You know, out of reach. That Hebrew word. Out of reach. I want to reveal all those things to you. That's his desire in our lives to do that. But here's the, question, here's the deal. We have to want those things. Amen? We have to be willing to say, Lord, it's okay for you to root out what I believe now to take me and give me something deeper in my mind. Amen? Well, I believe what I believe I believe. Well, you know, there, there, we have to be... <laughs> But the reality is, God, you have permission to renew some stuff, to help me see some stuff from a different way. And that's what God wants to do. And so we're going to go to a story now in, in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. 
Um, and one we're very familiar with. Anybody familiar with feeding the 5,000? We familiar with that story? Okay, just, just <laughs> before we get started, I'm about to wreck it for you, all right? <laughs> like, oh, great, that's one of those Sundays, yeah, okay. All right, so let's go to Mark chapter 6, verse 30, if you've got your Bible there, all right? Verse 30 says, The apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they, watch that now, they had done, and all that they had taught. So, now we've got to understand what, what's happening here. If you go back and you look in verse 7, it says this, that, that Jesus summons the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Verse 12 and 13 says, And they went out and preached that the people are to repent, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Now, and so then they come back and it says, now they, 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 they're huddling up with Jesus. They're having like a little debriefing after, after the mission. And they come back and it says, they were talking about all they had said, preached, and all they had done. Where's the focus? Them. Come on, on the they. That's right. They had done. Because what happened? They went out. And they began to proclaim the, the word of God. And they began to pray for people. And they, <laughs> you guess what? The, the sick got healed. The blind began to see. You know, the lame began to walk. You know, demons. Demons began to listen to them and were being cast out. All these incredible things were going on. And so what happened? You know, for, for a while now, they've been watching Jesus, right? And Jesus did all those things, right? You know, Jesus went about his business every single day doing normal Jesus stuff. You know, healing the sick and casting out demons and raising the dead. You know, normal Jesus stuff. And, and so what, what happened was, you know, they watched. You know, Kenny, did you learn to do what you do by, you know, did you watch somebody? Absolutely. We learned they were watching. But then it comes a day where, you know, it's time to get out of kindergarten. We've been watching. Right, now Jesus is like, hey, new level. You guys need to go start doing some stuff. And so he gives them power and authority and sends them out. And now they come back and they're like, whoa, Jesus, man, this is awesome. Man, we went out and, man, we were proclaiming and people were believing and, and, and we were praying for people and sick people were getting healed and, and, and blind eyes were opening and lame people were walking. And, and man, it was just demons. Man, we spoke to some demons and told them to get out and they laughed. Jesus, this is, is awesome. It's unbelievable what happened when we went out in your power and authority and did what you told us to do. It was pretty cool. How many of you think they're pumped? Come on. Do you ever get pumped? Do you ever get pumped up like that? God works through you and something happens. You know, you get stirred that you need to call Sally because there's something in your spirit and you call her and she's like, oh. I'm just so glad you called today. I needed to talk to somebody. What happens when you hang up the phone? Come on, Linda. You know what happens. Come on. We're like, come on, I'm a high five somebody, baby. Woo! Because what about us? We didn't do anything except be obedient to Jesus. Amen? But here's the deal. What happened was we get excited. That's the disciples. Man, it happened. There is nothing greater than realizing God's working through me. God's doing things. God's leading me. And as I'm obedient, man, stuff's happening in his name. That's what's going on with the disciples. Now we're ready for verse 31. It says, after the little praise party, he says, And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a little while. For they were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. And they went away in the boat to the secluded place by themselves. Now, these guys are on a spiritual high. But the reality is, they're tired. And they're hungry. They're starting to grow a little weary. And so Jesus says, here's what we're going to do. Let's take a little break. You know, let's take a long weekend. You know, let's go off by ourselves somewhere, and we'll build a little campfire, and we'll roast some hot dogs and some weenies and, and, and some marshmallows. And we'll just, we'll have some fish. And, and it'll be a nice time away. Just a time for us to re relax. And he, and he says, come on, let's get in the boat. Come on, how many of you are like, man, I, I, I like those times, amen? Come on, I like those times. Verse 33, it says, And the people saw them going, all right, they get in the boat, right? And, and many of them, and many recognized them and ran together on foot from all the cities, and they got there ahead of him. Now, I want you to understand that right at this point in the journey, Jesus is like a rock star, amen? 
People are like, Jesus is going to be like in Gaston. And everybody from everywhere starts running to Gaston. Why? Because Jesus is going to be there. All right, that, that's the picture we're painting here. All right, so here they go. They run ahead of them. How many of you, <clears throat> I mean, these guys are looking for some forward to some time off. Can you imagine what was going on? Come on, you ever happened to you? I, I mean, you're looking forward to time off, and you got some plans made, and all of a sudden, something comes up. Something at work, or something in the family, or some other thing, and all of a sudden, you've got a delay, or push back, or cancel. If Brenda was here, she could tell 15 stories, uh, 25 stories about you know, the, uh, what's happened to us in, in, over the last few years. Those things get pushed back. And the reality is, even as believers, we know what the right thing to do is. We know what Jesus would do, but we're, but we're seriously bummed. Amen? Like, why is this happening to me? It seems like every time we get ready to do something, something comes up. You ever been in that boat? Come on. <laughs> Come on, I, I see some heads doing this. I, I know exactly that boat. Been in that boat. You know. So here are, the, here are the disciples. They're now in that exact situation. They're ready, they're ready for a long weekend. They're in the boat. They're coming up the shore. They see all these people streaming down off the hills, you know, coming down to the shore where Jesus is going to be, and you know what they're thinking. Yeah, we know what Jesus is going to do. <sighs> Jesus is going to have some compassion on them. Jesus is going to look at them. Jesus is going to love on them. Jesus is going to start teaching them, and we're going to be in another all-day meeting. And we ain't getting to go away, and we ain't going to get to rest, and we ain't roasting no weenies. Verse 34, that's exactly what happened. Look what it says. And when Jesus went ashore, he saw the huge crowd, and he had compassion for them. Watch this now. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. How many of you know that there, we live in a community, our community is like sheep without a shepherd? I'm not just talking about they're lost because they're, they're in sin. We're talking about they're lost because they have no direction and no hope. Jesus looked at him and said, hey, hey, I, this compassion, we just can't let him go. You know, so what's Jesus going to do? Well, Jesus is going to teach him. Jesus is going to love on him. Jesus is going to proclaim in their lives. Jesus is going to do what Jesus do. Verse 35. So Jesus teaches them all day. It isn't like, hey, let's just have a little prayer time. Jesus like sets them all down on the hillside, and, and he's like preaching and, and, and ministering all day long. Verse 35 says, and when it was already late... All right, so now, now, you got to get the picture. It's late in the day now, all right? You know, the sun's starting to go down. The temperature's starting to get cool. It says, and his disciples come to him and said, this place is secluded and it is already late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now, I, I want you to catch the disciples' attitude. They're like, Jesus... You've been preaching all day. You've been out here teaching them all day, and we've been faithfully ministering to them. And, and Jesus, I, you might not realize it's starting to get late. And, and, and they're tired, and they're hungry, and if they don't go now, I'm pretty sure some of them are going to faint on the way back to town. So what we think, the best thing for you to do, Jesus, is just send them away. Now I want to submit to you, the disciples were not so much interested in the people as they were themselves. Because let me read this, what I believe it really says. They come to Jesus after ministering all day and, and being there all, in this all-day meeting, and they're like, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, we're tired. We're hungry. You know, and, and if we don't go now, we're not, we're not going to make it to where we need to get to because we got weenies to roast. So Jesus, what we think the best for us is if you just send them away. Oh, come on now. Doesn't that happen? It's like, well, oh, gosh, I'm getting tired. Can't we, just, can't we just stop and go on and, and somebody else take care of this? I want you to understand. And the reason it's important, because next week we'll, we'll, we'll pick this story up, but the, the reality is because of the disciples' perspective, because of their mindset, because of their attitude, they're going to miss what Jesus wants them to get. And I want to suggest sometimes that happens to us. Amen? All right. So, 
Verse 37 says, so they're like, send them away, but Jesus says, he answered them, you. Oh, you might want to circle that in your Bible. You. Notice it doesn't say we. You. Jesus to the twelve, you give them something to eat. And they said, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them to eat? So here are the disciples. The disciples are like, Jesus, you need to do something. Jesus, you need to fix this. Jesus, you need to you know, take care of this problem. And Jesus is like, well, you wait a minute. I, I've given you power and authority. I, I've given you, you know, the ability to do some stuff. And, and so now you just come back from this rock and mission trip. You know, here's what I want you to do. I want you to feed them. I want you to take care of them. Uh, 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 whoa, 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 Jesus, Jesus, hold on now. We, we can't do that. We can't do that. We, we don't have anything to eat. We don't have any food. We don't have anything at all. And, and if, 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 if we went and bought food, it would be 200 denarii, and that's nearly a whole year's wage for a, for a man. You know, and, and last time we checked, there wasn't that much in the general fund. And so there is just no way we can feed these folk. There's no way we can do this. It's just too much. And besides, if we do it, we're going to need it later. How many times do we find ourselves like the disciples? Identifying all the reasons we can't. And so I want you to, you know, because what happens? We encounter an issue, and here's what we start doing. We start calling out to Jesus. We start crying out to Jesus. Jesus, you need to do something. Jesus, we got this situation. Jesus, we got this one. Jesus, you need to take care of this. You know, and Jesus is like, um, I'd like you to do it. No, whoa, 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 Jesus, hold on now. You, you, you don't understand. This is how it works, Jesus. You forgot. We pray, we give it to you, and you take care of it. Now, we should be praying, okay? I'm not saying we shouldn't pray. But listen, prayer is not, hey, I need to let Jesus know there's a problem so he can do something. He's fully aware there's a problem, all right? We don't need to update him on that, all right? He's in the loop. But here's the deal. Prayer is, Lord, there's something going on. And ultimately, prayer is, Lord, how, what do you want to do in me in light of what's going on in this situation? See, that's what prayer really ought to be. It's not, hey, you need to do this. And so the disciples are like, gosh, but look what it says. Because here's the deal. Prayer is just, for a lot of times, it's just the easy button. I encounter people and they'll say, man, we got this situation. Well, what should we, we we should just pray. We should just pray. Yes, we should pray. But when we do that, what we mean is, bam, I I hit the prayer button. Jesus is on the job. Now I'm off the hook. (laughs) Look what it says, verse 38. But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Now, it doesn't say this, but you can read this into it. They say, we can't do this. Jesus says, you feed them. And then he says to them, well, guys, how much do you have? And here they are. They're like, Peter's like, John, what you got? What we got, man? I don't know. I didn't look. You do look? I don't know. I didn't check. I you know, they had no idea what they had. Why? Because they had no intention of doing anything. Come on. That's what was going on here. They had no intention of doing anything. And so Jesus says to them, go look. And do you, do you look at your Bible. You see, there's an explanation point there. This isn't like, well, you know, you need to go look. Jesus is like, go look. Go look and see what we have. And it says, and when they found out, now here's the picture. Jesus says, go look. What are they doing? They're looking. Come come on. Have you ever happened at your house? You say to your teenagers, hey, there's this this and this is in in the house. And you're like, well, I, I don't know where it is. And you're like, go look. And they're like, you know, well, with teenagers and, and, and men, we go and look and we still can't find it. But Jesus is like, you need to go look. You didn't even try it. You haven't even looked yet, but you, I don't know where it is. Have you looked? Have you looked? Jesus is like, go look. And when they found out, they came back and said, we got five fish and two loaves. You know, now, based on that perspective, how many think the disciples' hearts are really in this? <laughs> they are not in this. They had no idea what they had. 
See, I want to suggest the disciples were more concerned about their plans and their timing than they were on God's, time, God's plan and God's timing. What was it that God said? And I want to encourage us in that. God wants us to take what he's given us and do with it, with what he had. See, I want to suggest that when they came back with five loaves and two fishes, the disciples were kind of happy. You know why? Because Jesus is going to look at five loaves and two fishes and be like, all right, let's send them away. We don't, we don't have enough. We don't have enough. But look what it says in verse 37. He said, hey, great, let's do it. They said, we got five fish and two, or five loaves and two fish, let's go ahead and do it. Because notice what it does, verse 39, and he ordered them to all recline by groups in the green grass. Now, who, who, who did the ordering? Jesus. He told the disciples to feed him, but Jesus said, hey guys, guys, hey, he says to the multitude, 15,000, 5,000 men without women and children, 15,000 people, he says, hey, y'all start setting down in 50s and 100s. What's Jesus doing? He's ringing the dinner bell. He's telling them, hey, we're going to have supper here in a little bit. Y'all get to sit down and get ready. We're about to have fish and chips. Can you imagine the disciples' faces? They're like, what's he doing? What's he up to? We don't know what this is. And then verse 41 says this, watch. And he took the five loaves and two fishes, and looking up towards heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided the two fish among them, and they all ate, and they were satisfied. And they picked up the twelve baskets of the broken pieces of the loaves and of the fish. And there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. Most of us, for our entire lives, have referred to this story as Jesus feeds the 5,000. Right? If you've got little headings in your Bible, most of them say, Jesus feeds the 5,000. See, we have that picture we look at this story and we're like this story is about jesus doing something incredible and jesus doing a miracle jesus feeding the five thousand and as a result of that this is how the story goes this is how we envision the story working i need some volunteers got any volunteers anybody want to help me this morning come on come on guys if you're going to volunteer come on all right man i got i got five disciples this morning Woo! good thing i got five baskets right stand right here guys hold on here you go. All right, so here's how we envision this happen. All right, you guys stand right here. Stand right there for a second. So we envision that they've got five loaves and a fish. They've got a basket, and they've got the five loaves and the two fishes in there. And so what, we, we, we read the story, and it's like Jesus lifted them up. He prayed over them. Lord, thank you for this bounty. Thank you for what you've given us. Lord, feed this multitude. And then what Jesus did was this. He took the loaf, and he began to break it, right? He broke it. And then he began, you know, the first disciple, he began to put some, break off some pieces and put it in their basket. And when their basket was full, they went and gave it to people. And then they, 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 he did the next disciple. Go on, you know, go on, pass it out. You know, feed the 5,000. And then we broke some more. And we broke some more. And when, and when their basket was empty, guess what? They came back and, and, and Jesus began, come on, or, come on, Edward, come here, bud. You, you need some more in your basket. So Jesus began to break off some more. They began to put it in, the, and then they went back, and they kept going back and forth to Jesus until what? Everybody had bread. And then guess what? Then it was fish time. Come here. We broke the fish, and we started putting pieces of fish in there until their basket was full, and guess what? They went out and they distributed it all, and, and they, until what? Until everybody had fish. And then, when they were all done, the guys were like, hey, everybody's full now. You know, they took their baskets out, and they gathered it all up. Now, come on, guys, you can stand right here. We're not done yet. And the reality is, you guys are doing great. The reality is what? Jesus fed the 5,000. What did the disciples do? Passed it out. Amen? All right, so, so that's, the, that's how you and I, that's the flannel graph story. Amen? That, that's how we believe that. But I want you to notice what the text says. All right? Verse 41, And he took five loaves and two fish and looked up towards heaven. He blessed the food, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples to set before him. Nowhere does it say Jesus broke off pieces. Nowhere does it say he gave him pieces to put in the basket. Watch this now. Matthew 14, same story. 
Ordering the crowd to sit on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looked towards heaven, and he blessed the food and breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples. Breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. Now I want to suggest, come on back guys, come on. Here's what really happened. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks for them, and he broke the loaves, and then you know what he did? He gave Everett, oh, hold it in your hand, you don't even need your basket, put your baskets down guys. Because here's the deal. He gave them, come on, you're all right, come on. Here we go. He gave them each a piece of the loaf. Here you go. And then what he said was, go give it to the people. Now, what happened was, these, five, these disciples all went out, and they began to break off a piece of bread out of their hand and begin to pass it out over and over and over again. And they broke off, and they broke off, and they broke off, and the bread never ran out in their hand. You guys, you guys did great. You can sit down. You guys are awesome. He did the same with the fish. It never... <laughs> you can go ahead and have that. You can, have, you can have some fish and loaves there. You say, well, Brian, what's the big deal? The big deal is, in one version of the story... Jesus did the miracle. In the second version of the story, the miracle took place in the hands of the disciples. Watch this now. There's a huge difference between the two. The first story points that we need Jesus to do it, and we'll watch and, and, and take whatever Jesus does. The other is Jesus says, I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. See, I want to suggest to us there's a huge difference between the two. You say, well, why, why has the church embraced the first version so, hard, so hard, hardly? It's because we're afraid if I tell Lynn that God wants to work through her mightily, she might not do it right. But I want you to understand, Jesus isn't worried about that. He's not worried for one moment about whether or not you're going to get it right or not. See, what he wants is this. See, we've held on to that because we looked at Jesus and we said Jesus did what he did because of three things. That he, was, he did everything because he was God. He was God in the flesh, and because he was God, he could do all that he did. He did miracles, he did all those things. But listen, that's not what Scripture teaches us. Scripture teaches us that Jesus did everything that he did as a human being, how many human beings in the room this morning? Okay, I'm looking at about 38 of them. As human beings, in right relationship with God, washed in the blood, you know, saved, you know, you know, seeking to follow Jesus, and full of Holy Spirit. Watch this now. Jesus did everything he did as a human being, not as God, as a human being, in right relationship with God, full of Holy Spirit. You say, well, why did he do it that way? Because he came to be an example for you and I. He said, when I leave, you're going to carry out my ministry. And listen, you know, he wasn't talking about, well, you're going to do, I'm just going to do the, the, the simple stuff. He said, you're going to do the stuff. You're going to do what I did. You know, the normal Jesus stuff, everyday kind of stuff? He said, my church, is going to, that's who you're going to be. And here's the deal. Jesus wanted to teach the disciples this picture. He wanted them to understand. He wanted to work through their hands. But the disciples, the disciples were missing it. Man, they'd just been on the big mission trip. Man, they'd seen people getting healed. They prayed for people that got healed. You know, people were getting their sight back. They were, you know, demons were being cast out. They come back. Jesus says, you feed them. And all of a sudden, bread starts multiplying in their hand. And fish starts multiplying in their hand. What? No, you know, they co-labored with Jesus in an incredible miracle once again. See, I want you to understand, this story is not so much about the crowd. This story is about the, the disciples. This story is not about the crowd getting fed. This is the story is about what Jesus wants to teach you and I about who he really is and who he's created us to be. See, we have to have a change of perspective I want to suggest that when we begin to look at this story from a different light, 
suddenly we begin to see and realize things that we didn't see and realize before. That he has called us to co-labor with him. He has co-missioned us. You know what that means? Come on, Steve, help me for just a second, Steve, would you please? See, if Steve and I are going to co-labor, that means we're doing it together. Amen? Come on, Steve, stand right here. All right, we're, we're going to do it together. We're going to work together. We're going to share it together. Th this is not co-laboring. Steve, you go do it. And I'm going to stand over here and watch. See, that's how we treat Jesus. You know, Jesus, you go do it, man. We're going to cheer for you over here. Woo! We're cheering for you, Jesus. We know you can do it, Jesus. No, he's like, no, 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 no. Come alongside me, and together we're going to do what it is. See, we're not, we're not doing it. We are, good. thanks, Steve. We are doing it. We're co laboring with Jesus. We are carrying out his ministry. And we have to begin to get a perspective that says, you know, God wants to do way more than I thought he wanted to do. See, that's the renewing pipe right there. You know how many Christians I meet who think I, I can't, I, I, I'm not able? Jesus said, what do you got? Uh-oh. One of my favorite stories of the last 15 years, about 10, 11 years ago, we were doing, we'd been doing food ministry, and we were, um, there were 200-plus families coming every once a month on a Saturday, and we cooked breakfast, and you know, part of them would sit down and eat, part of them would come pick up their back, we'd deliver food. And so we were ordering food from this service and they would bring food and, and then we would have to box it up and and so you know we got I got lots of stories about how God provided in that um, but the one I want to share with you today is <sighs> that particular month we didn't have enough we didn't have enough money you had to pay ahead of time to get the food it wasn't like you got the food and then you could pay no you had to pay up front and we only had enough for about 175 boxes of food with all the money we had. Um, and so we order 175 boxes worth of food. We pay for it. But suddenly we realize we got like 225 families coming. What are you going to do? Well, well, let's call some and tell them not to come. That sounds like a really bad plan, doesn't it? Well, we, we can't. We don't have enough in the general fund for that. We can't do that. That's where we were, literally. We don't have enough. But here's what we felt like we should do. We should just go ahead and do it anyway. We can call anybody. So that Saturday morning comes, we're cooking breakfast, and, we're, you know, and, and things happen, and we're, 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 the food all shows up, and we put it on the tables, and we box things up, and we got like 45 boxes going out for deliveries, and we got some people who come pick up, some are eating breakfast. And here, here's what we said. Lord, you, you just got to take care of this. Lord, you're going to do whatever you want to do. And so what happened? We started passing out boxes. Two and a half hours later, we're, we're, it's all said and done, and we're looking around, and we're going through the list. And we're like, absolutely everybody who came to get food, who were one of the delivery, got food. Absolutely every single, more than 175, let me tell you. Somehow, by the hand of Jesus, through our hands, he multiplied that food. Amen? Come on. See, Jesus says to us, what do we have? What do you have? What have I given you? Let's start there. And see, this whole story is about what did Jesus say? Come on now, not what we said, not what the disciples said, not what society said. What did Jesus say? The key, what is Jesus saying? And Jesus said, you feed them. That was the word of the Lord. Lynn, when we get a word of the Lord, how, you think he can back that up? Uh, how, let's, let's vote. All right, I don't like voting, but let's vote anyway. You know, who thinks that if Jesus says, I want you to do this, he'll, he'll back it up? Most of us. Amen? He'll back it up. If he says, this is what I desire. And that's the picture he was saying to the disciples. And next week we'll pick that, that story up. And so the question for us is, what's Jesus saying? What's Jesus saying? I love it when Jesus gives us a word and then he says, what are you going to do with it? 
Amen? So, next slide, please. In Gaston, there is a widow that we know. She didn't attend our church. In fact, I'll cut this out of the video, but it's Sherry Jenny. Sherry Jenny lives in this house right here. Sherry came out here a few times. She attends the Nazarene church. She comes on Thursday to prayer meeting. I pick her up every week. Um, Sherry's been a widow three times. She's married and lost three husbands. She's 81 years old. She didn't have two nickels. This fall, all summer when I'm picking her up, I kept looking at that roof, thinking that roof ain't going to make it. That roof ain't going to make it. That roof ain't going to make it. And then it rained this fall. And the next time I went to pick her up, I saw this tarp. You can slide the next pic couple pictures. You know, front and back. She, I said, what happened? She said, it started to rain and it started to run into the house. She said, in five or six places, it was raining in. She said, I called Habitat for Humanity, and they said, well, if they got some money sometime, they could, might be able to fix it. I can't go down there on every Thursday without the Lord saying, what are you going to do about that, Brian? Here's a widow who needs a roof on her house. Her son lives with her. He's got some issues. You know, helps her some. She needs a new roof. Well, you know, Pastor, you know, I, I, I don't know what we can do about that. You know, we're old. We can't get on roofs anymore. And besides that, we, we need new furnace, and we need this, and we need that. And my guys were talking this morning about we need a new roof on the sanctuary. I don't think there's anything we can do about that. Here's what I want to challenge you this week. I believe God's saying, put a roof on our house. Jesus is saying, I want, I want to see a new roof on our house. That that's the word he has for us. But I, I don't want to be the one who says, you know, I'm, that's the word. I believe he speaks to us. And so this week, I want you to, to, to earnestly pray and say, Lord, what do you want us to do? Right here's this issue. It's right in front of us, right in our community. For a lady who loves Jesus with all her heart, who's a widow three times over, when my word says real religion is care for the widows and the orphans. You say, well, that's a real downer, Brian. No, it didn't. It's simply saying, you know what? We have to begin to say, Jesus, what do you want to do? Jesus, what are you saying? What do you desire? And then what's our response? I don't know how, we, don't, we, we can't, no. He says, here's all I'll be your response, what you got? What have I already given you? And I don't know what it is he's already given or he's already prepared, but I believe, uh, I believe this is all my heart. If that's his word, if that's what he desires, he's already lined it up. We just got to be a matter of collecting it up. And doing what he wants to do. Move on from that. The question is, what's the Lord saying? And it's not just about, you know, a lady's roof. It's about, what's he saying in your heart? What's he saying about in your life? What's he saying in your family? What, what's, he, what's he leading in your place? I tell you what, because it will change when we are faithful to do what he asks us to do, when he asks us to do it, incredible things can happen. I wasn't sure I would share this, but I think I should. Yesterday, I, I knew in my spirit I needed to go see Dora. And so I got cleaned up. You know, I was out splitting wood, and you know how the Lord is. You know, I, and even your pastor sometimes like, you know, I'm really busy today, Lord. You can I do it tomorrow after church? And he was just, no, no, you, you need to go this afternoon. So I went to the house, took a shower. You know, I was a mess. I went to the house, took a shower, drove into Gaston, and I w went to the door, and I knocked. Anne came to the door, and she said, Mom doesn't have long. And I went in, and Dora was laying there. Such incredible peace. I, I've never seen anyone make this journey in such unbelievable peace as Dora. But she's laying there. She hasn't responded to them for at least 12 hours. Um, she's laying there. She said, yes, you know, yesterday she said, Mom responded to us once in a while, but she's just been quiet today. And so I talked with Ann, and, you know, they're talking about celebrating and, you know, Mom's life and a lot of things. And finally, so well, I, I just like to talk with her and pray over her. And Ann said, well, that'd be great. And so I walk over, and I lay my hand on 
Dora, and I just began to tell her, I said, Dora, I want you to know you've kept the faith. You've fought the good fight. You've finished the race. And now the crown of righteousness which your Savior has laid up for you is awaiting you, along with those who have gone before you. And her eyes open, and her mouth begins to move, and she is rejoicing in that moment. Anne standing beside the bed, tears running down her face. And then she was silent again. Went outside and got a card because I wanted Ann to be able to call me if she needed me. And Ann comes out on the porch and she, she hugs me. I don't know this woman from, from anybody. She hugs me and she said, I'm so glad you came today. She said, we have, Mom hadn't done anything, but man, what peace we already had, but now multiplied because of the fact of her response to what, you, what you've said and prayed over her. Brian didn't do squat other than be obedient to what Jesus said. Jesus said go. I could tell you 15, 30, 100 stories just like that. You have some like that too. The question this morning is what's Jesus saying? See, we have to begin to look not through the eyes of what's Jesus going to do, but what's he going to do through me. That's the picture say, well, I'm not sure I'm worthy. I'm not sure I can. That's not what Jesus says. The devil says that, but Jesus doesn't say that. What's Jesus saying? And I just want to encourage you this morning that this week we begin to say, Jesus, what, what, what do you want to say to me? What do you want to say to my family? What do you want to say to our local church? It's not about what we think or what we want, necessarily. It's about what he thinks and what he wants. Amen? Well, let's just pray. Father, we thank you and we give you glory and praise. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you to speak to us, that we might hear the Spirit of Christ who lives in us speak to us. Lead us and guide us, direct us today, Lord. And Father, we'll give you glory and praise. Because, Lord, we, we don't want to just sit back and watch you. Lord, you've created us for so much more than that. You've created us to co-labor, to partner with you into bringing your heaven, bringing heaven to earth. We just thank you now, Father, and we give you glory and praise. And all God's people said,